Okay, buenas tardes. Is it tardes? How does that work? Or noches? It's, it's buenas tardes here. Buenas tardes, everyone. Uh, and buenas Justin, tardes. Justin and Chris are going to help us uh, admit people to this wonderful event. So my name is Dr. Alvaro Huerta. I'm a professor here at Cal Poly Pomona, and I'm a fellow at the Harvard Divinity School. And we would like to thank everyone for joining us for this amazing event. Uh, one of the best, most accomplished uh, photographers in the world, uh, Antonio Turok, is, is joining us. Uh, he's a Mexican, so that makes him even better. So we're really happy about that. And we're joined as with, uh, in terms of a discussant, uh, Marieta, who's a curator and an artist herself. Uh, so it's going to be a, an amazing event. Uh, so let me just say that um, today's presentation, it'll be more or less like an hour or so. Uh, the, Antonio will present, and then Marieta will comment. She's a discussant, and then we'll have some a Q and A session. But before we start with the the beautiful black and white slides that uh, Antonio Turok will present to us, I just want to acknowledge some people and institutions that helped us uh, put this event together. Uh, first, Urban Los Angeles uh, Cal Poly Pomona Library, the UCLA Latin American Institute, uh, the Southern California Association for Latin American Studies, and obviously our guest, Antonio Turo, Marieta, I'm going to butcher her last name, Bernstorff. Uh, Correct. I've been working on it for like an hour, so I'm working on that. Uh, Professor Jaime Cruz, Justin Torres, Chris Soleta, Dean Hawthorne of the, the library, and our amazing uh, graphic designer at, at, at Cal Poly that provided us with an amazing uh, flyer for this event. So this is, for me, it's, it's very important that we have a representation of Mexico uh, from people that are born in Mexico, that are part of the culture, uh, and that are, are intimately involved with the communities that they photograph or that they write about and so on and so forth. So there's really not that many people alive today that, that had this opportunity, like Antonio Turo, uh, since the 1970s, we are talking like 40, how many years now? 45 yeah. years around there? The first photograph you'll see in this presentation has now entered its 50th year. 50th year. So he started when he was in second grade. So he's 52 years old. Uh, and in the, the first photograph you're going to you're going to witness. So Antonio Turok is, is an accomplished uh, photographer. He's he's won many prizes like the Guggenheim, uh, many prizes in, in Mexico as well. Uh, shortly, he he and, and Marietta will be traveling to Italy where uh, he's going to be um, screening a, a movie or a short film that he produced. So he's very talented. Uh, they have a beautiful daughter that's in in Mexico City, and and also studying this, you know, social media and film and so on and so forth. Uh, so this idea of of having someone at, of uh, Antonio's caliber uh, present to us is very important because his during from the 1970s to the present, he's been able to document like the most marginalized uh, communities in Mexico. Uh, a lot of us here in the United States talk about the indigenous. Uh, we want to be like them and we praise them, which is great. But the but to be accepted into these communities is a different story, right? Especially because you're not one of them. So, so uh, as Antonio provides us with these slides, I, I do want him to talk about that. How is it that someone who is not indigenous uh, was able to enter these communities and be accepted and be allowed to for them to, for him to photograph them. Um, so without getting too much into it, I want to let the photographs speak for themselves. And like we say in East LA, muchas gracias, Antonio, for joining us. So he'll speak more or less for like 45 minutes, and then I'll, I'll throw a tortilla at him to stop, and then so Marieta can take over. Take it away, I wanna, Antonio. I, I also want to thank everyone on behalf of all of us. And I see some dear friend, a very dear friend, Gil Cardenas. Gil, who has been a big fan of Antonio's for many years. I want to say, make sure we say hello to him. Dr. Gil Cardenas. 
Yeah, he's one of the biggest art collectors in the United States. So. Oh, big and and an activist. Uh, so it's an honor to have you here with us. Gracias, gracias for that, Maria. Gil is one of my top collectors in my life. So I also send him a big warm hug. Him and Dolores. Um, well, after this presentation, maybe they can buy another one. So that would be. Yeah. <laughs> just just make sure I get my 20%. Uh, okay, take it take it away, Antonio. Okay, well, um I want to thank everybody for this opportunity. Um a couple of years ago, uh Balo invited me to a whole summer program. It was it, it was within the the frame of um United States and Latin America. So um, this is a continuation of, of that effort that uh, that Balo did um, two summers ago. I right, Balo? Yeah, that that's me. <laughs> yeah. That's you. Um, so he asked uh, Balo asked me to change it a little bit, and um, and so I'm going to start with. Um, my 50 years of photographing indigenous communities, mostly in Chiapas, Oaxaca. Uh, and it'll, you'll, you'll start to notice the, the evolution through these photographs, partly because you'll see how they, they traditionally dressed, which now it's very rare to see them dressed um, in their traditional clothing, which means that they're, they're very rapidly disappearing, um, which I guess is normal. I mean, every culture has to go through through changes. Um, and this is one of them. And that is that they're adapting to the modern world. But so is the rest of the world. So. The way I've organized this slideshow is that we start with um, we start with the very old photographs, then we go into the revolt that happened in 1994, uh, in which uh, the indigenous and the campesinos decided that they'd had enough that they wanted to be included as Mexicans and not just as, you know, some folkloric uh, presence of Mexico. From there, we'll go on to um, the other revolt, which is a continuation of the Zapatista movement, which is Oaxaca, which was a, uh, it started with the professors, um, Go, uh, having an uprising, demanding that their um, that their rights as professors be better pay, and um, and and be considered uh, and respected for what they do. And then I'm going to finish with this new, uh, which is some of my latest work, which is dealing with. Um, the refugee crisis, which is is really a it's a world problem. I mean, there's something like 250 million people stranded, wa wandering the world, and it's it's a I, I call it a crisis civilizatoria, which means that it's it's a crisis of civilization. Uh, and it's, it's, it's very tragic, it's very sad, uh, but it is a reality. And, uh, and I, I believe that through the power of photography, we can share and learn from, uh, from these expressions. Uh, so the way I've um, worked this slide presentation in the past is, and it's kind of like a game. So I, I, what I want to do is show you the full set of photographs. And then I want each one to use their 
visual intelligence, their visual memory, and then ask me um, which image they remember. And, and, and the reason it's, it's really interesting is because it, it forces you to precisely open up that aspect of, of education, which is you trust your visual uh, capacity. So why don't we start? And I'll, it, it, it doesn't last very long. It'll last about two, three minutes. But um, I want you to just close your eyes for two minutes and look at these images. Ah, what happened? You know, ¿Qué pasó? You know, nice. <laughs> we'd already tried it. Did you do play the, oh, there the play? There it, there it goes, there it goes. This one is, I, I sorry to interrupt. This is the photograph that was taken in 1973 in the highlands of Chiapas. So this really is the oldest photograph in, in this collection. I'll, I'll interrupt one more. This is when the Zapatista uh, army came into San Cristobal and knocked down the statue of Diego de Mazariegos in 1992 when there was a celebration of the, um, the coming of Christopher Columbus, now 500 years of the Christopher Columbus and this is how they began the uprising.
This is the, the, the uprising in Oaxaca of the professors in 2006. Oops. The, the, this project that I um, I started the uh, the immigration project um, in the late seventies, early eighties. So this goes back to nineteen. 80 on the border of Tijuana and um, and what's what's the uh, San Isidro? It's it's quite changed you now from the border that we see now. This is how most of the Central Americans cross from Guatemala into Mexico. They they use these light these um uh, actually everything gets moved through these rafts. These um, big um, uh, rafts and um, as well as the the commercial end of it. It's also the human elements. Um, in, in this case, what I discovered was that there were hundreds of Africans who had somehow or other made it across the Atlantic Ocean and made it as far as Tapachula, Chiapas, which is one of the newer uh, group of immigrants that have crossed or trying to get to the United States. It's not only Central Americans, but you find people from all over the world. This is a very, this looks very contemporary because I don't know if you read the news lately, but um, two weeks ago, um, a whole group of immigrants who had made it as far as Ciudad Juarez um, were detained in these centers, these um, immigration de detention centers but they're not given absolutely any rights of any sort. They're not giving, giving them, they have to pay for their food, their water, and they have to wait there till their immigration status is resolved. And the, the event of two weeks ago was they, some of them decided to burn their mattresses and the, the fires began to spread throughout the cells. So 
the, the Mexican police saw it and didn't open up their jail cells and they burnt to, burnt alive. 40 of them burnt to death. And so there's this whole contradiction of the Mexican government saying that they support the, the immigration movement and yet they're detained and, and not given any um, human rights um, facilities. So it, 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 it's really very sad. This is uh, uh, Tijuana, the, the amazing border that divides Mexico and the United States. Maybe I should start with this photograph because this, this is the last year of the Trump administration when they were pulling children away from their mothers. And th this lady um, was Salvadorian and uh, she went to her appointment across uh, in 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 El Paso, no, no, sorry, in, in in Tijuana, and and they immediately pulled their children away, and and separated them, and they told the lady that if she ever wanted to see her kids again, that she had to write off a letter saying that she would never again make an uh, an attempt to go back into the United States. Well, a day went by and two days and she could see the that they were separated and she immediately signed anything. And they finally gave her her kids back. But she's, the kids were complaining because they said that um, they'd given them some sandwiches with cockroaches. And um, she, she, I mean, she was so devastated. You can see her telling the story and the tears coming down, you know, her face. Um, she said that it was one of the worst situations as a mother, uh, you know, having to go through this. But she was one of the lucky ones that um, was able to recover her kids. And then, of course, you get um, you get these people that have crossed, who can never cross the border, and then they they go crazy, and you see them all over Tijuana. Um, I had a terrible experience with uh, an ex marine who became like the leader of all these. Uh, uh, people and he sold them the drugs and he sold them all these different you know, protected them but there's hundreds of them who who get stuck in Tijuana and 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 are completely lost they have nowhere to go so this is some of my latest work um so what I want to do is now ask each one of you um, to think about which images you want me to talk about. It, 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 it's, it, it's a beautiful, um, it's a, you, you'll see it becomes really exciting because we, we, we share another, the idea of this experiment is that we all participate in this dialogue. It's not only me talking. So with that said, I'm going to start with Marietta giving her opinion about this. So we'll have Marietta speak, and then I want everyone to think about 
we're, we're like doing one image that, that you that attracted you and then and Antonio can respond to it. Let's uh, see how. Yeah, but I don't have a, I don't have a, yeah, but I don't have it, Marieta. You don't have to move. Oh, there it is. Let's see. Marieta, go ahead and unmute. I'm seeing if, if it doesn't affect. It, it, I, 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 there's an echo. Okay, why don't, why don't we do something, Marieta? Why don't you um just just go where um, Antonio's sitting? Because they're, they're in the same place there in Oaxaca. They have a beautiful home. Okay. And then she's just gonna make some comments about his um, his photography and and who he is as an artist, and and then we'll we'll uh, open it up to questions and images that you that you like or love. Um, hi, I, I'm gonna. I'm aside from being Antonio's wife, I'm a curator. Yeah. I'm a curator of uh, of Antonio's work, and I'm a specialized in uh, social projects. Antonio's work as, uh, aside from being a partner who's watched him photograph throughout the years and what's important to him, is probably one of the most important documentations for Mexico uh, because he has documented areas for more than 30 years at a time. That is to say that you don't go in for a month, but you stay and you document as years go by, like the case of Chiapas, the case of immigration, he started that in the, in the 80s. So he's seen immigration change throughout all this time. He's documented in Central America, Oaxaca, and other parts of Mexico. And I think in the work, what repeats itself is that yes, there are some beautiful things and yes, the indigenous communities are amazing. But the real thing that he always tells you is the poverty, is the struggle of people of not only indigenous communities, but all uh, immigrants that are trying to get to the United States is how depleted their countries are or crime infested or uh, dictators, like in the case of Nicaragua at this moment. Um, we also have governments like in Mexico that are very complicated. It's not all, it's not a good guy at times, you know? So there's all these, um, I think, one of the most important things when you see his work is that he's trying to show you the reality of a country, not covering it by giving you beautiful images, which a lot of people do in National Geographic, which there is, Oaxaca is beautiful, but Antonio is really trying to tell a human story. And that is trying to get other people in other countries to understand the difficulties these people have and why they want to get to the United States. Not that the United States is the answer, uh, especially in today's time, Los Angeles has 53,000 homeless. Uh, they, they certainly don't need more. And a lot of immigrants don't know that. A lot of misconception stories, there's a lot of people who have taken advantage of these people by telling them uh, that they will find a better place when they don't really know where they're going. So. I think through his work, he tries to express this as much. It's not an easy collection. Uh, Gil is one of the important collectors. When you really understand what he's trying to tell you in this story, it's not as some of the images of Antonio Beautiful that you can live with forever and others are very difficult to, but they tell you a story that's extremely important for us today. So um, well, along with his Guggenheim and his Rockefeller uh, Fellowship in Mexico and Aperture exhibitions and constant promotions here in Mexico, he's a Sistema Nacional de Creadores, which is a grant given to the top of the line artist in Mexico. And now uh, he's off to Venice where uh, at the Pavilion of Architecture where he'll be showing a video of the indigenous communities of Chiapas in a uh, project called Cancha Campesina. Uh, that's a whole other theme that we won't get into now. But that gives you an idea of who he is and what he's constructing in this um, slideshow. And when I say you're looking at a little teeny section of his images he has over 30,000 negatives. And some are more difficult than others, some are less difficult than others. 
but this gives you just a glimpse of what he's done for the past 40 years. Anything, uh, Valo, do you want to start with the questions? Yes, gracias, uh, Marieta and Antonio uh, for, for um, shedding light on, on Antonio's work. So do, do people have questions? This is the time either you can raise your hand and vocalize it, only positive stuff. If someone says ne something negative, I'm just going to delete you. Only positive stuff uh, about the work, about the questions. Uh, you can put in the chat or you could just raise your hand and then uh, just uh, unmute. Damn it. Okay, he's on his way in again. Not all at once, it's a little bit overwhelming. <laughs> mm -hmm. He's he's on his way in, the, the computer. Okay, or... thank you for sharing the images are very... Okay. There were so many... Uh, okay, well, the good thing is that we have a backup well i guess i lost my it didn't charge my battery um so okay let's get... so uh, uh antonio there's a question by kendall if you can read it in the chat it says thank you for sharing the images are very powerful there were so many uh, i want to know more about it's hard to choose there was an early one of a woman something of her face that was interesting maybe of, of an indigenous yeah all right, something horrible happens here. Um, yeah, go, go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, I have the idea that she's talking about one of the very first images. Yes, yes. With her face is covered with uh, mud. So she's called the mud lady. And her story is one of these amazing... Um, dramas of of life because uh she um she uh was married to the main um uh his name is the alferes or the pasion he's the one who pays for the entire festivity uh uh of um of the community well he died during his uh, during his reign, right? When he had to be the main character of the fiesta, and because um, he died, she has to uh, take over and pay all the expenses that he left in, in his debt. Well, um, they gave her the right to have a little place at the marketplace, but that meant she had to um, walk back and forth from her town into San Cristobal every day. In, in the process, uh, she was raped by some young kids from San Cristobal, of which she had a baby. From when the nuns of the town figured out that she had a baby, they called it the baby of the devil and they snatched it away from her. And they said that um, she was, uh, you know, uh, some weird kind of a, a human being. So she went crazy and she used to go up and down the streets of San Cristobal. And back in the 19, early 70s, that picture was photographed in, uh, 1975. So, um, uh, so she, there was no paved streets back then. It was all um, dirt streets. So she'd go around um, putting mud on her face saying, uh, this is why I have a mask on to defend myself. From the from the bad men who had raped me. Um, let's well, gra 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 gracias with that, um, um, Antonio. That's a really um, to tell us that that really sad story um, that actually takes place. So we, we need to learn about those stories. Uh, Alan, 
is asking a question. We have Josh with his hand raised, and we'll get to him. Thank you, Alan. Oh, so let's Alan, see. we're trying to get my computer back on. I can. We can hear you. You're on. Well, like, because I will The host will let you in again. We have to get. Can you let Marietta in? Yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. Only... Yes. Okay. Uh, Okay, uh, Antonio, it, the, they're, they're in Oaxaca and the internet is. Okay, so we have Alan is asking about this estudiantes and Samer is asking, wants to learn more about the 1980s. So I'll just. I'll... There I am. Okay, why, why don't you give, there, there was one photo with the, the estudiantes protesting in Oaxaca. Um, well, what was that about? Why were the estudiantes protesting in Oaxaca? Well, the, it all, it all started, the, the, the photo, all those photographs were taken in 2006. And for 28 years, the professors said, uh, rebelled every year they would um go on strike every summer uh demanding better salaries uh higher wages more um uh how, how do you say this in english um uh, more uh better wages better, better wages and better um living uh, because for some strange reason, the Mexican government had divided by zones who were the, the professors that should earn more and who should earn less. And Oaxaca being one of the poorest states in the, in the, in the country, they were always at the very lowest. So they were trying to get a better wage, a, a, rise, a raise in, in, their, um, in their salaries. So they took over the, the downtown of Oaxaca, the, what's called the, the Plaza or the Zócalo. And the Mexican government, the local government, the, uh, the Oaxacan government decided to, uh, uh, to go in and um, destroy their, uh, uh, their movement. And so they turned around and uh, started a, a revolt, which lasted eight months, uh, which is what I photographed, uh, which, which was really quite amazing because um, they really, the, the professors and the locals uh, eventually took over the, the entire city. Uh, so what eventually happened was that uh, the Mexican government didn't know what to do because the, the government was in the hands of the people, not of the government. So they had to bring in the, the, the federal troops or the National Guard to break it up. Uh, so when you look at some of those images, you, for instance, there's one where it's, I call it the burning bus. And so what these young kids did was that they would take, they'd sec sequest, uh, they'd kidnap, they would kidnap the buses and burn them. So that day they burnt 127 buses and confronted the, the National Guard with something like 23 people being killed. And, um, but what was, Truly, to me, the most amazing part of that whole event was that I felt it's a period of my life here in Oaxaca where I felt this the, the most secure, you know, because, you know, they, it was run, it was ruled, run and ruled by the people, for the people. And it was a, a moment of great um, uh, hope that, that things would change, and, and they actually did. Um, one has to kind of understand how Mexico works, you know, 
There's a saying in Spanish that says, el que no mama, eh, no, no tiene derecho a chillar. So, so people really came together. It was uh, a peaceful, it started out for the first seven months as a peaceful movement. Uh, there was no guns, no um, confrontation, but as the federal government wanted to end the movement, then it, be, it started to become more violent. But that, that to me shows uh, the great resilience of the Mexican people. I mean, that's the positive part of a lot of my photographs. Even though you might notice poverty, but they're, they're an extremely generous, uh, we're a very generous nation that's willing to share the good times and the bad times. And maybe that's why I like to show these photographs because there's always a, a hope that things will get better. Uh, Thank uh, you, Antonio. Why, why don't you talk a little bit about yourself? Because that Al Shitley, for me, it's um, when we see somebody accomplished and all these photographs and everything you you've done. What what I want to do, especially for the students here, and I see some professors from other campuses and and other people. And then we'll we'll get to some of the questions in the chat. And then Josh had a he, actually his comment was about, about the buses burning, but um, like who? This is kind of like the movie Nacho. Who is Antonio? Like, like <laughs> can you talk a little bit about your own evolution, like in terms of? Okay, well, I'm. Where, where were you born and your family and like so people know who you are as a photographer, as a human being first, then you know, then your vocation. Okay, I'm I'm the exact opposite. Um, from all these thousands or millions of um, human beings that are trying to get into the United States, thinking that that's uh, going to be, you know, the, the streets paved in gold. Well, my parents were born and raised in the United States, in, in, in the Boston area. Um, and in the, in the early... In, the late 40s and early 50s, um, during the McCarthy period, my parents felt very uncomfortable living through that experience. So they decided to migrate to Mexico, which is where my sister and I were born. So I really, um, I'm, I'm sort of like, a lost soul without really knowing what his identity is. I don't know if exactly if I'm an, you know, a gringo or if I'm a Mexican, but I've never lived, the longest I've ever lived in the United States was when Gil invited me to Notre Dame and I spent almost 11 months there. That's my longest tenure in the United States. So away from that experience of being at Notre Dame, I've really spent the rest of my life in Mexico. Uh, and it's, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting because uh, how can a white man like me be able to integrate into the Mexican culture? Well, to begin with, I, I don't think that, um, the issue of racism can be analyzed the same way as it can in the United States, or at least that's my appreciation. So throughout my entire life, I've always been able to, um, you know, go up to, you know, go through different communities. Some are indigenous, some are peasants, some are middle class, some are the rich. And because you, you have an open mind about life and about, and you're curious about what other people think, people will open up to that. Um, I, I've never really felt that being a white man was gonna be an obstacle to go out and, and, and photograph uh, these different communities. I, I don't know if that makes any sense, but, 
it is the, I'm not trying to say there's no racism. There is a lot of racism in Mexico and especially towards indigenous communities. They, they really do consider them to be inferior to the rest. And, and many, of the, many of the politicians and the rich people think that the, the indigenous people are what holds back Mexico from becoming a first world nation. And in my case, I, I really believe that it's the other way around. I think that the rest of the world is missing out on, on a millennial, a thousand year old culture that has so much to offer, so much diversity, so much, they're, they're uh, incredibly wise in, in understanding plants and medicine. And that's that part of, of, of Mexican culture is, is dying because there is no real respect. And when you think about the Zapatista movement, that was what it was about. It was trying to get the rest of the world to accept these differences. So to me, the, the, the Zapatista movement, even though it, it had its great moments, is now pretty much, you know, uh, vanished. But it, it did something real important, and that is that the, that revolt, that uprising, gave the indigenous people of Mexico a sense of hope and a sense of dignity. Um, and so, it, you know, it, it, it's really kind of fascinating to see and go to the Indian communities and to, you know, I just got back from doing a small film and, um, you know, they've come a long ways from those first photographs you saw in the early 70s through the 90s through that revolt. Um, how many of these young kids have now gone to college, have now, you know, gone back to their community, they are agronom, they, they, they're, they work in the land, they, they're doctors, they're lawyers. And so there, there, there's something very positive about what happened during that period of time. And, and I think that's why I like to show those images because it's, it's just, uh, it, it gives me the sense that I, I could actually say, yes, we can learn from history, that history does, is important. You know, as, as long as we don't forget our roots and we don't forget who, who we are and where we come from, things will, will get better. So, you know, I, I do see indigenous communities doing a lot better now than they did way back in, in, in the 70s. And maybe that's why I went out and photographed during the 70s and 80s, because I wanted to share with, with, with everybody who saw my images, you know, the value of, of, of these amazing um, cultures, you know, that, that, that they were very different to us, but were very, very um, secure about why they wanted to preserve, why they wanted to be uh, in, in resistance against, you know, the, the Spanish rule. Um, and so it's, to me, these, th this group of photographs is, is also, it's a, a sense of um, observing how it's been evolving, how Mexico has been evolving, and how actually I believe that in Mexico you live better now than you would 50 years ago. I mean, a lot of, um, you know, a lot of these cultures that had no rights back then are now fully integrated into the society. That doesn't mean that it's perfect, but there's a sense of hope. Um, and um, and so to me, that I, I still think that that's the importance of a lot of, of observing these images, because you can see that evolution. You can see that even though there's that poverty of which Marietta was talking about, 
you know, about the struggle for a better, uh, uh, better chances of having education, health. Uh, I mean, but this is something that's not only uh, unique to to Mexico. I mean, the United States is always going through these struggles too, and in in that sense. Um, we can see through these images uh, what's really happening on, on a world scale. Um, I had the opportunity. Oh, yeah. Antonio, Antonio thank, thank you for that. I just want to remind the audience, I, I want everyone to, to, in the chat, just put like, what's your favorite image and why, and just show some yeah, love. Maybe, maybe we should just talk. The yeah, story. yeah, sure. So, no, this is great. No, what you're doing, what you're doing, and what you're saying is great. I really appreciate that. Um, I, I think a lot with a lot of people here. I really, I, I like the fact that people are are staying in in the chat because a lot of times people drop. And really, the the thing with Antonio, he's very humble. Because uh, a lot of us, like I said, we we talk about the indigenous, or we talk about this, or we talk about that we're anti-war or or Black Lives Matter, but but we're very comfortable, those of us who are in the United States, right? So the thing that what differentiates someone like Antonio is that he he literally goes to those communities. He, like he literally goes to those places where there's no, we, they don't have the comforts that we have here, right? So it's, it's, it's something, it's a, the difference between talking about, like just talking and doing, right? Oh, thank uh, so, you, Paulo. But um... and, and, and all of that, and, and also with uh, because I want to ask Josh had wanted a comment. I wanted him to ask you directly. And also, like in in the nineteen eighties, he was in Central America, and literally any anyone in Central America that was opposing the the regimes, the the military juntas that were supported by the United States. And I only say that because I have tenure, so I can't get fired. Literally. Antonio was there documenting those atrocities supported by the United States. And at any point, people, at any, this is why you have to stick around because you're never going to hear someone like this, you know, speak again. It, it, it literally, literally, at any point, risked his life. Like at any point, he he could have gotten killed. His his fellow photographers were killed. He witnessed it, and so. There, we have to appreciate that that commitment, you know, to to the vocation of, of photography, at a human level. Right. So when I say Antonio, I see a white guy, but when I get to know him, like I, with full disclosure, you know, we're friends. He's friends of my family, a uh, really good, good, um, you know, friend to the family, the, the Huertas. Yeah. And when I see he's 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 actually he's a Mexican, you know, he's he's more Mexican than me because he. You know, because uh, I like uh, the salsa that I that I have is mild. You know, he is the real, the hot one. You know? <laughs> so what I'm saying is, it's about the culture. It's not about how we look or the race. It's about the culture, right? So to me, that that's what's important. Is the culture, is the values, is is what people believe in. So I want I want Josh because he he, he volunteered to uh, unmute. So I want him to ask a question and then um and then yeah. so. I'll, uh, Antonio can respond to that. You know, it's it, it, it was kind of tragic that I lost my. Um, the I thought I had connected my computer, and and I guess it's an old computer. It, it's, so it's not a problem. It's, it's being recorded. So all all of the, great the no, the problem is that I read a chat that they wanted me to scroll, which I thought is a great idea, for me to scroll through some of the photographs. Um, so what, while I talk, I, I'm going to try to set the, the slideshow on Marietta's, um, what, what, what did you answer Josh's question? And then, and, yeah. and then we'll, we'll do that. Let's, let's just do one at a time. Cause we have like 15 minutes left. Go ahead. Josh. So, um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, go, so, ahead, go ahead. 
Um, you... Yeah, so just real real fast, um, muchas gracias, uh, Dr. Huerta, for, for, and everybody involved in this event. Um, it's like super impactful, like I just said. I'm, I'm, I study festivals in Oaxaca. I'm from San Diego um, in the border region. So all of that, so many of the pictures were really meaningful. And uh, just real fast, the bus I was at, uh, I was in Oaxaca City in 2016 for the 10 year anniversary of that protest. And uh, I was there when they took up over the reoccupied the Zocalo after they had murdered um, some of the protesters out, uh, outside of Oaxaca City. And I had gone to dinner and when I came back, there was a bus burning. And that was when I like knew, oh damn shit, this is happening. So anyway, so that bus picture really, really like hit me in that sort of sense. But my question is actually, because I'm going back to Oaxaca this summer. And um, like I said, I study festival and it's kind of academic slash artistically in between and also, uh, since you've talked about your work and this is the recent you know conversation about being a white guy doing this work um is because I'm starting to get even though my IRB you know says that it's okay for me to take a picture in a uh, at a festival because there's no assumption of privacy I have this thing about uh working with these marginalized racialized communities where I, I'm, I'm extra sensitive in the world that we are in right now so I guess I'm just asking methodology methodologically about that process of consent in particular with indigenous communities and at those festivals um, where there isn't, like I said, the assumption uh, of privacy, but yeah, does that make sense? That's a, that's a really great, great, great question. And I'll try to um, explain it to you. You see, most people, most people want to be a part of something, part of history, part of of, of a story that reflects who they are. So my approach is as long as somebody, if I sh sh point my camera at someone and they don't walk away, I know that they want to be photographed. It's um, if somebody, you know, covers their face, I don't even intend to take their photograph. Why should I? That would be that would answer your question. That would be invading someone's privacy. But most people don't act that way. Most people love to be photographed because it gives them a sense of belonging. You know, you're going to give the best um, view of them to the rest of the world, and people love that. I mean, people really are good-hearted. They're they're people are good. Most people are good human beings. It's just, you know, sometimes a few rotten eggs that spoil it all. So I would just use that um, that approach. If they don't say anything, just feel at home and go and, you know, follow your bliss as an artist, as a photographer. Come back with great images. Talk about your experience. Uh, don't, I mean, don't think that, you're stealing anything because it's on it's the other way around people are wanting you to do that mm -hmm. that's been my experience as a photographer mm -hmm. uh, that's a great point i will and thank you because and just want to end on i when i was in oaxaca i saw a march against uh, femicides and and one of the marchers spoke in english to the crowd and said you need to take this message outside of oaxaca so i appreciate and that you're you're lucky because <laughs> I was photographing the, the one of the first marches of women and and one a little young girl she must have been 18 said don't you dare take my picture you're a man yeah and I said oh gee I'm sorry but no. yeah so no, then but... I walked I walked along the march but I really didn't get involved like you know yeah generally which is walk within you know looking for the photographic angle well Towards the end of the march, she came up with um, some solvent and threw it in my face. So then I said, I guess I deserve it because the women had asked me not to, part you know, because I was a man, not to participate. But that yeah. was my fault for not having paid attention to what they were saying. Yeah, pon, at pon atención, amigo. So, okay, Josh, thank you for that. So we have a lot of other questions um, in the chat. So it's actually related. Do you think, let me let me just say one thing. 
because like I said, I'm I'm being full full disclosure. You know, I, I work at Cal Poly Pomona. I'm a professor, and and I'm also at Harvard Divinity School. And uh, I need a raise. So actually, I, this is why I'm doing these things because they don't pay me enough. Um, <laughs> you know, for me, for me, it's when I see the photographs of the indigenous people. Wh what I see more than anything is that like you you're humanizing them. Because when we see, like in la telenovelas of the indigenous people, their caricatures, there's like India Maria, their stereotypes, you know, there's all these racist views. Like the way indigenous people are treated in Mexico are, is the same, is similar to what the way African Americans are treated in the United States. So when I see your, your, your photographs, I don't see, I just see the humanity in them. You know, I see the beauty in them. So that to me, that's like what attracts me to it. Even though I can't afford your photographs, because uh, I still hold student debt, but let's not bring that up. So, for to me, that that's that's really what matters. It's not the color of our skin or anything. It's it's like the you're capturing their humanity, and by sharing it with the world, they're we're seeing them in in a different light, right? Than than the stereotypical Spaniard way of of, of viewing these communities. So someone asked in the chat, do you think it, do you think that like being male, being white, being it, that that privilege that you have, and you know, I have male privilege uh, myself, do you think that has allowed you to be in these spaces? Or do you think, or I'll just leave it like that? Well, like, I how, mean, how do you it, see it that like your own positionality? How, how has that affected I, you? No, in part, you're absolutely um, correct. I mean, there is that element of, of racism, but I've also lived through situations where the racism is, is, is the other way around. Um, like, like in Los Angeles, for instance, the hardest place in the world I've ever been to photograph has been Los Angeles. Or even in, 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 in South Bend, the Mexican community there, was very reluctant to let me photograph them because they couldn't quite understand how a white man could speak so fluent Spanish. And that meant that I was either an, an agent of, of, my, of, of you know, ICE or one of them or worked for the CIA or something. And then, and, and you know, the, the, there was a lot of racism towards me in Los Angeles photographing the, the Mexican community. And I wasn't ready for that. I really wasn't. Um, so it, it, that's why I, I express a little bit how, why I believe that racism in the United States is different to Mexico. Because if you um, walk into a, 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 a community in Mexico and just, you know, don't charge your way and just start talking to them without pulling your camera out, and then they start to loosen up, you'll probably be allowed to take the photographs you want. Whereas to me in, in the United States, that has not been the case. I've found it to be very difficult. And maybe that's what I would love to do, or, you know, is one before I can't carry cameras is take another long trip to the United States and uh, maybe take the, Route 66, right? Buy myself a a convertible, you know, 1958 car, and and dress Marietta up with a, you know, like the, the um, what what's it called with, with like uh, in the Simpsons? What's her name? Marge, right? And 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 I have us drive through the United States and see what happens, you know. Why is it so difficult to, to photograph for that country? Because um, it is a challenge. Um, and I do believe it's real important that um, we photograph um, our society. You know, the, this whole new dilemma with artificial intelligence is, is, is really worrisome. I mean, more so than ever now, these photographs acquire a completely different message because now we don't know if you ask a program a software program 
can you please do a photograph like Antonio Turok? And all these algorithms will work. They'll look me up in, on the internet. They'll see what kind of photographs I do and they'll reproduce it. Uh, yeah, but, but they, don't, they don't have the hat that you do. Oh no, that, no, they that, they, that they can't do, but. Yeah. Let me see, Ant Antonio. That's another whole issue. Yeah. Antonio, ah. we're, we're running out of time. So I know there's some questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to. Uh, so why don't, what, what, what I'm most interested is, is, um, you know, cause our generation, you know, we're, we kind of, mess things up for for the way things are right now. So what I'm most interested in is in the youth, you know, like my son and your daughter, and, and that generation. The, so what message do you have to young people, you know, in their 20s, 30s, in terms of, like if they want to embark in being a photographer, being into film, being an, an artist, or, or any of the creative activity, like, as someone who's been around the block a few times, like what advice do, do you have, uh, do you want to share with them to, to our students and also adults too, but, but many of the young people. Oh, you know, I, I think the, oh, I think we lost them. Oh, there we go. Okay, todavía estás aquí? Okay, so you're, you're muted, you have to unmute. Okay, you, you, Antonio, you have to unmute. Go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. I'm... No, no, it's okay. So what, what advice do you have? Of, one, we want yes. people to fill out the survey, but what advice do you have to the younger generation? Well, and sorry for not, all, not getting to everybody's questions. First of all, I, I would suggest that young people have to become more curious, more engaging in the world that surrounds them uh, because th there's so much wonderful things that are happening on the planet. And if, if we're completely self-absorbed into thinking that you need the latest telephone or, you, or that um, consumerism is what's important in life, then you miss out on, on, the, on the true essence of, of spirituality. And I noticed that, you know, it's, the, the world is becoming smaller and smaller in, in the sense of being curious. Why does this, why is this happening? Why, why are we going through this ex horrible experience? For instance, global warming, I know that it sounds terrifying to all the young kids, but it is a reality and you have to confront it. So the only way to really participate in the solution of global warming is to ask the, that question, what can I do? Even if it's just a small little, um, it's, like, it's like you know planting a, a, a tree, just drop a little seed. And watch it grow. Watch it, um, you know, become big. Watch it flower. It, it takes a little bit of patience, but that's what I would suggest to to all young kids, because that is, after all, the world that you have to live in. And we have to we have to figure out a way to discover solutions for global warming. We can't just sit back. And, um, and and not do anything about it. But it's the same. I'll, I'll say that when I started to photograph, the world was very different. We never even imagined there'd be global warming. But there were all these challenges on the humanistic level of which I believe that I belong to. I belong to the generation of humanists. And, and how can us human beings live to, side by side in a better way? And I think I've contributed, um, and I've always uh, believed that most people are 
are willing to uh, to stand up for that. And so now young kids have to find their own battles, have to find their own um, way of, of participating. And one of those, which I find to be one of the, the main um, questions of today's age is global warming. How can, what can you guys do? What, what would motivate you? Um, especially in the arts, you know, um, why not, you know, go out there and, and, and try to express what your feelings are about the issue. Um, it's, it, it, it really is. It's, uh, it's a question of curiosity for all of you kids. Can you remain curious about how things, how life um, works and, 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 and can your life have meaning when you participate in these events? I don't know if that, if that. Yeah, no, that, that definitely does. Well, I just, I just want to wrap this up and I want to really everybody virtual applause for our brilliant presenter, Antonio Turok, humanist. Everybody, I want to see everybody. Uh, me too. I'm going to applause and also for Marietta for giving her analysis and contribution. Uh, the people in Oaxaca, they, it's a whole different culture over there. You know, like you call them, it's, it's like, Antonio, I have business. It's like, and then he hangs up on me. No, necesito que ir a tomar mi café primero. I have to go guard it. It's a whole different world. And it's a better world than the fast paced culture of America that, that we live today. Yeah, uh, I recommend you to go and start a, a little garden somewhere. Grow your own little um, mm -hmm. lettuces. It, it, it gives you a completely different perspective to what life means. You know, if you grow your own food, um, you share it with your buddies. Imagine if every college in the United States had a communal garden, you know, where everybody could go and work on the land. Things would be, it would really make things different, you know, instead of, you know, you go to class and then, you know, you're just, you're just wondering when the next vacation, when the next spring break is, you know, try to, yeah. Yeah. Try to grow something, you know, try to uh, be more communal. It just really just, makes a big difference. Yeah. Just, just don't grow the marijuana, but you'll, you'll be good. Grow, grow that food. I see our people. Oh, no. They, now, they, now you, you guys, and you, I don't, I can't do this stuff because it makes me. <laughs> but if if anybody here, and I know when I was a student, I was broke too. But if if, if you ever gonna vacation anywhere in Mexico, my motherland, go to Oaxaca because it's one is is cheap, it's safe, it's clean, the water, everything. I mean, my my people are from Michoacan, so don't don't go over there because the cartel will kidnap you. Um, no, that's okay. So that's just, not true. We were just in, in, in it's true. Well, my that's, uncle is he's part of the cartel, so let's not, let's not disclose that. So <laughs> uh, I, I just want to thank Turok, and I want to thank everybody for, for being here with us. This has really been an amazing event. Uh, and I see some of my, my students are here, and those of them that are not here, just let them know that they're going to fail the class. Um, this is a really an, an, an amazing experience. To, to hear in, from someone that um, has done so much for, for Mexico, for those of us who are Mexican, those who are not Mexican, who are interested in Mexico uh, in, in a very in a very real way in, tr in contributing in humanizing the indigenous. Um, and I really appreciate everyone uh, that who, who has participated in this event. Uh, and the critiques that, that people have, have made are, are legitimate as well. So I don't wanna dismiss that. But I just want to end on a positive note. Uh, all of you, I really appreciate you uh, joining because every time one person joins, I get like a free taco at Cal Poly, so just y'all know, or a panda. Uh, so that, that's something that is important to me. Uh, and if any of you are part of a university or, or organization, you know, invite Antonio to speak uh, in Zoom. You know, it's, it's, it's something that... Um, 
And you could just you could just connect with me, Alvaro Huerta at Cal Poly Pomona. It's easy to find me. Trump finds me all the time. Uh, and and I'll, I'll make sure it happens. Uh, it's not easy. I mean, we talk about privilege, but there's no privilege when you're a photographer in Mexico, uh, especially during the pandemic. There's no privilege, you know, with that. So anytime we can get a, a world-class photographer to speak to us, then, then we want them to to give them opportunities to to educate those of us who are in El, El Norte about about some of the realities of the indigenous people and, and other other um, social movements taking place in in Mexico, uh, my motherland. Uh, and with that, so with that, like we say in in East LA, uh, my other motherland. Muchas gracias por todos. Uh, gracias Antonio y Marieta por por estar con nosotros. Y, y si miro otra gente. Uh, aquí a uh, Annalise y, y otra gente que, que vino para participar en, en este evento. Y si no entienden lo que estoy diciendo, um, this is America, learn Spanish. Muchas gracias.